Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg in Life. Today we're going to look at how angels talk with us. The topics we're going to cover are how angels work with our desires, how they relate to our memory, and how they operate within the truths we already know. So I think it's one of the coolest ideas out there, angels. People call them a lot of things, being of light, spirit guides, but it's the same concept. People of some kind who aren't limited by space and time and physicality, who are extremely loving and wise and are present with us, with an immediacy that even people close to us in our lives don't have. These angels know what's going on with us. They know the details of our lives while also seeing the greater arc of our story, often in ways even we don't see. And they want to help. They believe in us and love us even when we don't. They see hope when we can't. And according to many, they're always with us, even when we can't see them helping us. But how are they helping? I have yet to see an angelic deposit into my checking account. So what (laughs) role do they play in our lives and how do they play it? Stay tuned. All right, so, sorry, we're here, we're back. Sweet Morgan Life, thanks everyone for coming out on a Monday night to watch this show. I'm excited, a lot of good things happening today. My name is Curtis, and I'm from the Swedenborg Foundation, a nonprofit group that tries to get Swedenborg into the conversation. So hopefully we can do that in a way that enhances everybody's lives tonight, or at least their evenings. My guests today are Dr. Thane Glenn and Chelsea Odner. Happy to have both of you back on the show. You are my friends, and I am glad to spend this time with you. So mm-hmm. thanks for coming on. Yeah, me too. Hey, <laughs> don't don't comment on whether you agree that we. We share that friendship. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about a- how angels talk with us. And actually, we're going to kind of skip the way that most people describe angels interacting with people, which is that there's all kinds of reports of experiences where angels just show up and talk. You know, people will say things like, oh, I saw my, my grandmother and she looked young and she talked to me. Or somebody will, pe- people have all kinds of stories about an angel, you know, stopped me from crossing the street then or I, something came to me in a dream. You know, and Swedenborg, too, you know, talked about direct interaction with, with angels. But what, we wanna, what I want to look at today is where are they when we don't see them and hear them? They're always with mm-hmm. us. How are they always with us? And I want to look at some of the nuances because Swedenborg gets very detailed and nuanced in his description of this sort of interaction of, of the mind with angels. So um, if that's cool with all of you at home and with you guys, I think that's, that's the direction we're going to take it. So our first segment for discussion is part one, they work with our desires. And what we're going to do to illustrate that is take a look at a clip, or I mean a quote, which is a text clip from Swedenborg. This is from Secrets of Heaven. The angels through whom the Lord leads and protects us are near our head. Their job is to inspire neighborly love and faith. They also watch the direction our pleasures take, taming them and bending them toward good so far as our freedom allows them to. They are not permitted to act violently, breaking our cravings and our assumptions, but must proceed gently. So right there, it seems like Thane, he's talking about angels sort of operating within our psychology, kind of uh, looking over our, the, the direction of our intentions and kind of, and that, is that, that's sort of a theme that, that carries across his descriptions of angel people interactions, right? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I, I think really marks Swedenborg's theology of, of angels is the idea that they are operating kind of influencing our thoughts and our intentions um, and our, our emotions. Uh, and so we might not be aware of that, but they are constantly trying to lead us towards something good um, and uh, in, in very gentle ways, in ways that are not going to you know, take away our freedom or whatever. Yeah, so Chelsea, <clears throat> do you want to comment on that? He says the other day they can't break us or, or really force things, but they sort of have to work with what we have. You know? Yeah, I think um, the the sort of takeaway I have from you know having read passages like that is um, it reminds me of in the Word how it says talks about the still small voice as opposed mm-hmm. to the hurricane, the, I mean the fire, oh, right, right, all that. Right, right. Um, and because uh, I feel like in my day to day life, there's it seems like it's always easier to have this default, you know, argumentativeness or want to like snap at somebody or whatever, but. When That's I realize, why we brought you on the show. It's like a little fire, you know. I, if I have the presence of mind to stop and get quiet, then um, then I can 
you know, that sort of angelic presence is there, but it's a little bit quieter. Mm -hmm. So I have to get quiet myself in order to try to tap into that. And, you know, like that engages my freedom. I have to do something in order to try to feel, well, where is there a sort of loving kindness that I can connect to in this moment or something? Right. It shows like sort of a limited or that there are rules of engagement, uh, that kind of thing. Oh, I'm, I got to remind everyone, (laughs) Write questions, write comments to us. We have an upcoming questions segment uh, next part of the show, so you guys can write down your thoughts and feelings. What do you think about angels? How have they interacted with you? Or how have you heard about that? So for the next time, sorry, I forgot that. Um, yes. I always forget that. Uh, so <clears throat> but back, to the, back to my really good point, which was, <laughs> man, w- if angels are there, why didn't they stop this guy from honking his horn at mm-hmm. me? Why don't they stop shootings? Like, what? Why don't they make us all good? Why don't they teach us everything? So, but there's this sort of clause of like, you know, we they can't. Um, there's certain ways that the human mind can't bend. You know, just you got to slowly like working with a tree. Sort of, it seems more like a, a grafting or sort of a gentle mm-hmm. leading. You know, mm-hmm. and so that would make more sense uh, with with the way that human minds are. And that, as you were saying, we kind of have to make the first effort to. To let the operation happen, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you guys agree or disagree? <laughs> <laughs> agree. Yeah. I, I, I like the example of uh, you know why why don't they stop that guy from honking at me or whatever? Yeah. And uh, um, or at I least just, strike him down in some way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or at least condemn him. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> no, I uh, I mean I've had the experience of driving and having you know somebody honk at me or cut me off or whatever and have that split second anger come up. Uh, but I've also had the experience of then it being followed by a thought like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, that person wasn't trying to cut me off or that person was scared and that's why they honked or whatever. Um, and, yeah. and so to me, that's where the angels are operating in, as, as Chelsea said, in that still small voice and that quiet moment of pause before I, you know, act out on my anger and, you know, go after the guy with the baseball bat or something. Yeah. <laughs> and that is in... In that, in that, that's sort of the, the way Swedenborg describes a lot of angel mind interaction is it's this sort of subtlety and, and right there in our thoughts and feelings, you know, that this is that he, you know, that it's a normal thing for there to be spiritual influences in the thoughts and feelings, you know, pulling us up, pulling us down. And that there it's kind of like, it's not like they force your hand or something, although who knows if that could happen in some cases, but it's like, they are the ones who enable this presentation of an alternative reaction Hmm. to say like, okay, here's something a little warm and fuzzier. And we're just, if you give us just a little bit of airtime, we'll give this to you. And then you at least have that. They they sort of enable the positive side of the choice. Hmm. So, and and I think that, um, did you have a, yeah, go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. We, go, we do need. We talk. We were talking before the show about getting buzzers or something. We really should. <laughs> I mean that, but we just don't have the budget for it. Donate now, okay? So, okay. Um, just that I think that is a unique. I, I mean, maybe I don't know that well, but um, something unique about Swedenborgian teachings is that way that, like, so we all sort of have a sense of, oh yeah, I am thinking all the time. I don't necessarily have to believe this or that thought. You know, all the thoughts are always flowing in. But in a Swedenborgian framework, then that all of those thoughts are either coming in from an angelic place or coming in from a, you know, more hellish place. And mm-hmm. so that we have, if we're, you know, think of, or like take the time to get, become aware of it, then we have the choice to either, you know, do the one or the other. The, the thought thought choice and in really impulse, can, like which impulses do you act on is really sort of spiritual uh, navigation that, that, you know, you're, you're actually moving further or, or, um, I always, I always have pro- like further or closer, um, anyway, away or toward this mm-hmm. heavenly sort of influence. Um, so that actually works well into our, our next one. So let's take a look at the second topic for discussion. Uh, they relate to our memory. So this is, again, they being angels. And this is, we're going to look at another instance where Swedenborg is describing specific operation. And he learned this firsthand. You know, for, for, if anyone's new, hasn't heard of Swedenborg, he was a, you know, a scientist who began having all of these spiritual experiences that he chronicled very extensively. And so he would actually be able to perceive the operation of angels uh, on his mind. And he would see, he would, we can sort of like feel it abstractly, but he would know, oh, this is exactly what's happening. So here's a, a recording of him detailing that. When angels exert an influence, they attach feelings to it. And the feelings themselves contain too many elements to count. But we accept only a few of these countless elements, only the ones that relate to what we already have in our memory. 
The rest of the angelic influence surrounds these core items and holds them in its embrace, mm. so to speak. Um, so it's, it's an interesting concept, and I sort of have to stop and like let it sink in a bit. But it, so he seems to be saying that um, Chelsea, that angels can be saying things to you, but unless you have something in your mem- or, you know, in your mind already that can kind of respond to it, you don't necessarily pick up what they put down, right? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I definitely feel like I have a experience of that in my life or I guess I've learned that and um, you know it's basically saying the more that you you know read sacred scripture and you just get these lines in your head then that gives um, the angels something to work with and so then when Mm -hmm. you're having a if you're having a difficult moment or something and you get quiet you might all of a sudden have the thought of some you know positive idea come to mind or a a specific phrase and it just applies to your situation and like that is the activity of the angels drawing that up in your mind even though it feels like oh i just thought about this thing that was handy yeah you know it always feels as if it's just us but that it's actually this angelic influence and that whole embrace thing at the end um you know swedenborg yeah. says that the lord flows into all of us with like all of his divine love and all of his divine wisdom like that's always available to us but we we're only receptive to whatever, you know, to some portion of it that we open ourselves up to. And so the more that we, you know, so there's our part in it. So that makes me think of like the more that we read and think about things and that gives the angels something to work with to enable that in flowing. Yeah, you come across that. Well, partial receptivity, all of it, like, you know, our our eyes can only see a small portion of the the actual spectrum, you know, uh, radios, depending on where they're tuned, will only let in certain waves. So there is kind of that, you know, you do see that. Uh, you know, sort of analogs to that idea of the, it's all there, but we're just not picking it up all necessarily. And Dana made me think of your example of I'm um, getting honked at and you wait, maybe that guy wasn't trying or I'm getting uh, cut off or something that maybe that guy wasn't trying. You'd have to have a concept of, oh, people can do things they're not trying to mm-hmm. be doing before, you know, which most people have. But, but you know, unless you sort of have this knowledge of others, there's nothing for the, you know, that, that those angelic sort of influences to rest in, hmm. you know. So that, that sort of seems like that, that was a small example of it there. Yeah, and uh, I liked your phrase, uh, knowledge of others. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about this idea is it takes time to build memories, you know, whether it's just purely sensory memories or whether it's memories of concepts that we learn or whatever. And I think by the same token, it takes time to build compassion. Mm-hmm. And we build compassion through having experiences of our own suffering and then our own um, transformation of that suffering and, and uh, through learning what it is to be other than ourself, right? And so, um, mm-hmm. you know, I, uh, to me, it's such a big process. Um, and this all relates to how angels communicate with us because... There are things that I understand now that I couldn't understand when I was 16 um, because I just hadn't had the experience. I hadn't had time to build that memory understanding of what being a human is all about. Yeah, I when I was yeah when I was around that age, sixteen or so, like I was very developed in certain areas, like I could think and walk and talk, and was being, starting to be able to drive. But as far as empathy and really understanding that on every the other side of all my actions is a person, you know, just like in dealing with mm-hmm. authority or other people's property or something, you know, I just uh, I hadn't woken up there, I hadn't been born there. So yeah, definitely, um, that's why you know we can sort of sense as people that, oh yeah, this is somebody going and and helping somewhere and really learning what other people are going through. We can sense, okay, that's, that's putting some good things in you and that's going to change your outlook. And this is in the Swedenborgian view, this is creating sort of that place for, to receive, which is exactly what this next quote is about. So let's get to our, our next one. Uh, Amazing transition. Part three, they operate within the truths we know. So this, and we'd already mentioned this a few times, and this is going to be a long quote. So bear with me, everyone. (laughs) <laughs> and that, that you, you got a preview of it so now that you saw it like sit down get something to drink you know and just like relax stretch because we're going to be here for a long time with me reading this quote uh okay i'm ready evil spirits have sometimes pushed evil and falsity on me and at those times i have sensed oh wait you got to go back okay now it's even longer all right ready <laughs> 
Evil spirits have sometimes pushed evil and falsity on me, and at those times I have sensed angels, empowered by the Lord, holding me to the truth that had been planted in me. In this way they withheld me from the evil and falsity. The experience also showed me that religious truth that is rooted in us by a desire for truth is the plane angels operate into. It is also worth mentioning that angels' activity surrounding the religious truth we know is rarely noticeable. Rarely do they stir explicit thoughts about the concept at issue. Rather, they inspire a general awareness of notions that buttress that concept, along with the connected emotion. The angels work by exerting an imperceptible influence, which, when presented in visual form, looks like a stream of light. The light consists of countless truths within goodness that encircle a single concept we possess, maintaining us in the truth and at the same time in the love that goes with it. So angels lift our mind out of falsity and protect us from evil. Okay, so I totally forgot what most of the quote was about because it was so long. <laughs> now, there's so many things I wanted to stop and say, oh, yeah, sweet boy. You know, a few of them I remember, you know, he's describing there this, this battle of the positive and negative forces in the mind, like you were mentioning before, Chelsea. Um, and so he's talking about uh, that they have to operate into this plane that we already have. There has to be something there. Um, there's just a, a lot of interesting things that that called to mind for me. Dane, did it did it do anything for you? <laughs> Nothing. I was okay. Just, I was right. sleeping no, through it. No, no problem. Um, <laughs> Thanks for your honesty. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I love the last or near the last phrase there about um, maintaining us in the truth that we know and the love that goes with it. Mm-hmm. And um, for anybody uh, watching who is not familiar with Swedenborg's basic theology, mm-hmm. um, it's all about the idea that that truth is how we know love, and love is what life is all about. Uh, God is love, and God uh, transmits uh, love to us through truths that teach us how to love. Um, And so I think about something really basic, like the great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, every um, kid in the Judeo-Christian tradition grows up knowing that, but, uh, you know, I feel like in my life, I'm just beginning to understand some of what that means. Um, And, and the more that I, like we were talking about before, the more I build that understanding of who other people are, who I am, um, you know, what it means to have compassion. I feel like the more I'm opening up those channels for those little quiet thoughts to come in about, um, you know, maybe this isn't my enemy, you know, maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe this is just another human being that I'm supposed to love. Mm. Yes. It's unfortunate, an inconvenient truth. You know? <laughs> yes. Um, so, and it's interesting in that that uh, passage where he's talking about that the, the angels are exerting an influence that's holding you in that. So, you know, in times of when you're not at your best self or when there's some kind of crisis, it's a lot harder to still be going with what you, you feel like are your higher truths. And so mm-hmm. that, that's just interesting to think of. That's the angelic influence is trying to hold you in that or in some, t- some time of hopelessness or some kind of crisis, you know, that there's, that's the influence. There, so. Chelsea, did you have any any thoughts on the um, subject? Yeah, uh, I, you know, next to my name, it could have just said mother in addition yeah. to blog, yeah. <laughs> New Church Perception. We didn't know how to spell it. Whatever, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but connecting back to what we were saying in the last segment about um, the, you know, talking to other, getting in a sense of like another person is another human being who's having their own experience. Yeah, um, which is really, yeah. It's true, but it's very hard to really understand functionally and, and believe and live by. You know? Right. Well, I think there's a line that I've heard that's, you know, you are the company you keep, so keep good company. Mm-hmm. And how valuable it is to hear other people's stories. Um, and so, and there's a truth in that. Like, the more stories of other people you hear, the more that I think the angels can work into that mm-hmm. to just connect you into community. And that helps so much to get through hard moments. And so, like, especially as a mother, like, I think of the times when, you know, like, the kids are driving me crazy. And it's because I've talked to other moms who have been through it, who have, you know, they've, after decades, they've learned how to actually love their children, you know, <laughs> talk about loving the neighbor, like loving this person you've created. And so, um, like, that, the truth of experience and how that is what, to me, connects me into compassion in really hard moments is, like, when I've, the more stories I've heard from other moms and their experience of motherhood, then when I'm in a really tough moment, I'm like, oh, yeah, somebody else is going through this too, or, oh, yeah, somebody told me they did this, and Mm -hmm. it just is so practical. Like, and I just think that's what sort of is so helpful, however that... I forget how that relates to the yeah. quote. But. Uh, 
<laughs> we're just we're just that's chatting. all i have to say <laughs> but you gotta you gotta learn it in the field you know you can you can kind of like oh yeah well i've <clears throat> I've researched animal behavior, but if you're going to go out and try to tranquilize an elephant to, like, help it if it has it. I saw this show where an elephant had this, like, abscess on its face because it was shot. And so you got to know what you're... You can't just have read a handbook. So, like, just the same thing when we're dealing with the elephants inside, mm -hmm. you know. you got to have the same sort of thing. So, everybody, that's, that, that's our discussion on how <laughs> angels are talking to you when they're not talking to you. Uh, so hopefully that's something cool, and we want to hear your thoughts and questions, comments on it, and we'll be addressing those right on the other side of this video break, so stick with us. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we are talking about how angels talk with us, uh, as Swedenborg described it, but now we want to hear some of uh, what it's meant to you, this, both this concept and the idea of angels and perhaps even your own experiences. So let's take a look at our very first comment. Uh, this is from M. Christina on YouTube. Does Swedenborg go into detail about whether our angels are most often our loved ones who have passed over, or are our angels evolved beings who change over time as our needs change? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a great question. Um, mm -hmm. he, uh, I'm going to open the floor by saying he doesn't go into detail about necessarily who your angels are. You hear in near-death experiences, you know, 90% of the time, the first people you meet are relatives or, or people that you've known. Swedenborg does talk about us living in very close conjunction with angels, um, but he doesn't say if that's if that's grandma or, or grandpa or something. But I also, that's an interesting thought about do they change over time. He does talk about um, different kinds of angelic influences with us as we grow, that when we're, when we're children, the, the deepest, the celestial angels are with us, and you can tell when, you, when you're interacting with the kid, and then as we grow, there are different types of animals once we get more rational, different angels. So those are my initial thoughts, and would anyone, does anyone have a rebuttal to this? Chelsea? Um, yeah, I went to, a, uh, I guess it was actually like a grief group for people who had lost loved ones close to them, and, um, and it was in one of those moments, something that somebody said totally made it dawn on me like, oh, that makes so much sense that we would be con like, you know, because if we if we align and sort of what our character is like with the other people in our family, like your extended family, or especially when you have a sense of like feeling connected to some, you know, ancestor of yours that you never met or something like who knows just that it sort of makes sense that family members of ours might be more intimately connected, like might be those associate spirits with us that um, that we, you know, I just remember growing up as a kid, always thinking, oh, that it's just all these random people I don't know. And it's like, well, actually it makes a lot more sense that I would have a sense of knowing them if I yeah. were to, and well, maybe that's family. And know. Swedenborg talks about, you know, s spiritual or psychological heredity, that there's, that you, it's not just genetics linking, physical genetics linking you to your family. You know, you're, you have similar spiritual inclinations and that in the spiritual world, it's similarity of mind that draws together. Mm -hmm. So if you, if there were family members who were similar to you, that you would, you could have that sort of connection. Um, anyway, thing. Yeah. Wrap it all up, man. Sure. Well, uh, yeah. There in the countdown, uh, if anybody's watching it, there was a, a quote about um, that we are reunited with our loved ones after mm -hmm. death, and um, and so I would expect that uh, that our loved ones are. The ones we love and the ones who love us so they would want to be close to us and so i, I would imagine they're at least in the mix there but mm -hmm. also i think um it's important that uh in swedenborg's theology essentially we get to choose who we hang out with spiritually you know mm -hmm. and so um if uh if we're feeling <laughs> Uh, like we're not into loving people, we're going to call to ourselves less loving spirits. If we're learning better how to love other people, we're going to be calling to ourselves more loving angels. Yeah, yep. So whichever side your family falls on. About. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, family. Um, okay, let's take a look at our next question. Thanks very much for that one. Your Garden Day on YouTube says, Does Swedenborg suggest that the resurrected human becomes an angel? Does our higher self equal our guardian angel, and has every angel lived as a human? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I always get to 
speak first because I say the easiest thing. Show. But, but um, I'm gonna I'm gonna forfeit that and I'll let Thane start this one. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Oh, I get the easy answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, Swedenborg uh, suggests that um, that angels are all human beings who have passed into the spiritual world. That um, that there's no separate race of created angels, um, and that. Uh, that's important because it's all about freedom and free choice, that, that every, every person goes through a process on this earth where they choose if they want to become an angel, if they choose if they want to live in that love of God and love of each other. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I think about, there was a part of that question that says, your higher self, is that your guardian angel? Um, and I don't want to like split hairs with terminology because it's something I barely understand anyway. But he does say there's like an inner self, which is a sort of a direct link to God. And Jealous, you were talking before about all of God's love and wisdom is pouring in. This is sort of like where it pours in this higher self or inner self, he describes it as sometimes. Um, and it seems to me like you have that sort of connection, but then there are also these other people who are angels who are who are helping you out and those would probably be more what people would generally think of as guardian angel mm. type situations yeah. but it's a cool I, one. I could end up su- surprised when i get there so yeah oh uh, just a thought i don't know if it's worth sharing but i thought that you popped in my share mind it. but don't even think that <laughs> um is uh that i think that's a cool idea to think of your higher self as your guardian angel and i just was reading recently about um you know people talk a lot about the divine trinity you know got um, and uh, Swedenborg emphasizes that there is one God with whom is the divine trinity. And mm. that so that there is this, um, you know, sometimes we have the sense of ourselves as being just one connected individual, but then that we really do have this higher self and a lower self that we can be sort of looking to our higher self. Like there could be a usefulness in just imagining it as this, you know, part of you that knows better than this other part of you that doesn't. Um, yeah, so. if it makes you nice, it's good. Yeah. It is. Okay, <laughs> Go thanks very it. much for the question. Let's take a look at our next one. Uh, this is from George. Uh, I, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> on YouTube. How do you recognize that you are, that the angels or demons are influencing you and not as just yourself actually doing these good or bad things? Mm. Um, and that, that gets into, I'll just take the first one on this. That gets into sort of this whole topic of Swedenborg's psychology or his, the collective not just unconscious, but the collective conscious. And he says that, you know, his, his sort of awakening was to realize, oh, there's spirits around me all the time. Like a, his, as he called it, spiritual eyes are open. And now he's noticing, oh, there's, we're always being influenced by heaven or hell. And Chelsea, you alluded to this. So what he would, what Swedenborg says in his writings is, um, you know, the evil thing, the evil that comes to us is from evil spirits. The good that comes to us is from good spirits. When we think it's ours and act on it, we can make it our own. Like, you know, there can be, you know, evil spirits are trying to tell you, hey, man, write a nasty comment about this show. <laughs> and <laughs> and you, if you, if you think, and it's not your fault, they're influencing you too. Actually, that might, that might not be evil because if this show needs to go down because it's harming the human race. Um, <laughs> the point is to do something bad, steal candy from this child, um, steal, not candy, steal healthy food from this child. I'm trying to think of something that nobody could ever argue isn't evil. Anyway, uh, <laughs> evil spirits are suggesting this. Um, and, but if you think, that's a good idea, I'm going to do it, then, then it doesn't matter where it's coming from because you believed it was yours and you made it your own. So mm-hmm. in that way, um, everything is an influence on us. In every action we take, we can be, the good actions are coming from heaven and we can align ourselves with heaven and the bad actions is hell or, or um, ego and we align ourselves with that. We take mm-hmm. it. So that, that's my very long opening statement. Um, mm-hmm. Closing remarks, uh, Chelsea, your thing? Um, uh Sure. I mean, it um, makes me think of, in the word, it says, you know, the Lord says, my um, yoke is easy and my burden is light. Mm -hmm. And I really think that that comes into play when uh, Swedenborg has this passage saying, if we recognized what's really the case, that all goodness comes from God and heaven and all evil comes from hell, then we wouldn't take credit for the good in us and we wouldn't blame ourselves for the evil in us. And that really just, like, that totally lightens the load. Then it's Mm -hmm. not about, like, oh, I want to be a good person or, oh, I'm so horrible for being having this all these bad parts of me, but you just like, well, what do I feel like aligning with mm-hmm. today? Like mm-hmm. I'm just, you get a lot of um, range of motion <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you recognize that. We would be saved, <clears throat> saved or free in an instant. 
he says, if we really, mm -hmm. really believe that. So, Thane, do you have any? Yeah, just thoughts? maybe just share a, a personal experience, which is, um, you know, the question was, how do we know when it's our own mm -hmm. mind conjuring stuff up, and how do we know when it's a spiritual influence? Um, and as you, you, you all said, uh, Swedenborg says, well, it's all spiritual influence, and we get to choose what we do with it. Um, I know for myself, uh, you know, growing up like everybody, I had the experience that, well, of course, these are my thoughts and my feelings and whatever. And as I've gotten older and done more meditating and praying, I find that every once in a while, I'll have just some positive thought pop into my mind. And I'll kind of say, oh, I would never in a million years have, like, determined to think that right now. Like, I might be in a really bad mood and some, like, saving thought comes to my mind. And it's just, it's really clear to me, I didn't generate that. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, and there, there is something to this, like, what's me and what's out of me. Because you certainly, and I, I, I'll have sort of similar experiences of, like, uh, when I'm go, going in some kind of downward spiral and something comes in and I'm like, I never would have thought of that. Because there's all these other times I didn't think of anything like that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that, and maybe that's when there's something even you know, farther from our nature. Like, this is, a, this is a higher heaven of some kind, you know. So, anyway, it's, if you think about how complex life is, the spiritual interaction with us is, is that complex. So, there's, there's going to be all these nuances to it we don't understand. So, all of you out there, so hopefully these can these ideas can, can be part of something you're incorporating into your picture of it. And just know that there's probably a lot we don't understand about it. And we're just kind of trying to weave this tapestry with, with these concepts as they come. So we got time for another one. So let's take a look. This drive-by poet. How important is an intellectual acknowledgement of the divine? Is it not okay mm. to believe in God? God? Is it okay not to believe in God if a person is virtuous? Mm. <laughs> It's a great question, um, and it's a tough one. Depends because, on who you ask. Yeah, it depends on who you ask, right. Um, so you would, I mean, Swedenborg will sometimes make s statements about the essentialness of, of uh, acknowledging the divine being, and that this is central to everything. And he will talk about uh, people who don't acknowledge God are atheists, and but he always, seems like he always equates that with, He'll say, like, they, they don't acknowledge God at all. In their hearts, they think it's fine to murder and steal and right, kill. And so, right. so that he kind of, cause, because he was seeing things so, like, acknowledging God rather than being lip service, you know, is like God being goodness and right. uh, that the God is love. And so my guess is that if you are interacting with love or God on the, you know, loving the neighbor, that kind of thing, um, there, there's some kind of, even if not intellectual, acknowledgement of, of the force itself. So, um, yeah. It's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just, it makes me think of the 12-step concept of a higher power and mm -hmm. how that um, a higher power can be a divine, you know, human being or something, or in the earliest, you know, I mean, just like in the most basic phase, it's just community, like just connecting to something greater than yourself mm -hmm. and how... So, but by calling it a higher power, is that saying that person's acknowledging the divine? But I think they are, um, even though it's not a particular person, it's the community. So that the usefulness of connecting to the neighbor and that, mm. um, and yeah. Very good. Yeah, uh, it's such a great question. And, and Swedenborg, so as you I, said. I do want to say, people are asking great questions. Yeah. These are, these are like hard-hitting, well-thought-out questions. So yeah, yeah. thank you guys, A+. Plus. Okay, sorry, continue. A++. Plus plus. Yeah. Um, and I'm a professor. Yeah, he's a teacher. Um, you can really put that on your report card. No. Uh, oh, yeah, he, he, as you said, he often does um, say that it's really important for us to acknowledge a divine, a higher power in our lives. But he also says over and over again, that God, what is God? God is love itself and wisdom itself. Mm -hmm. And so if we're acknowledging love and wisdom in our lives, I think we are acknowledging God in a sense. And I did run across a passage recently where he said, um, a person who is living in true charity towards the neighbor is, uh, you know, is living from God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and, I, and just thinking about it, just stepping back and thinking about it rationally, like there's a lot of good reasons to not, believe in God. You have like, you know, a lot of uh, religious fundamentalists acting in obnoxious ways and that could easily influence somebody to say like, okay, this this whole thing must be a farce. You know, you see people, a lot of people who are claiming, oh, we believe in God. We, we really like God and, and doing really bad things. 
So, uh, you know, it just seems like, and coupling that with Swedenborg's assertion that, you know, all, if someone from any religion, if they're living how they how they believe is really right, can that's a path to heaven, makes you think that it would have to be, even if somebody isn't like saying, oh yeah, I, I believe, I, I acknowledge an idea that there's a human God that's looking over the universe. You'd think like, yeah, if they're interacting with love and wisdom um, and living from that, that everything's good. So and I've heard it, yeah. tagging this on the end here, but mm-hmm. I've just heard it um, talked about, you know, thinking of God as a verb and not just this, you know, noun and that right and that that connects to you know swedenborg's idea that god is love itself and wisdom itself so if you're acting in that like you are in you're moving that is god so yeah yep yeah. uh, all right so there's our those are our <laughs> decisive definitive answers <laughs> think about um, that for a week to, to, to sort of answer your question all right I, I believe we have one more to go to okay zen soul on youtube can angels ever appear or speak to us in a physical visual way can they affect our lives in any way other than with our thoughts, like leaving $20 on the street or something. <laughs> um, man, that would be nice. Um, and if they could do it once, they could just leave a bunch of 20s, <laughs> right? I'm thinking, um, well, certainly, yes, they can talk mm-hmm. to you. I mean, Swedenborg, like it's all of his writings are based on being able to be talked to by angels and spirits. So, And you don't need to just reference Swedenborg for that. I mean, you, you go go like uh, find any kind of... like. Uh, forum about spiritual experience a lot of people are having angels talk to them do something um and as far as their influence within like could they could they influence your mind to have you notice the 20 i don't know if they could just like fabricate one because Mm -hmm. swedenborg says like there's order in the physical and spiritual world and you can't just break the laws of order but i would imagine they could like let you notice um Mm -hmm. oh hey look there's something over there Mm so those are my first thoughts um chelsea um yeah, just thinking, it, it was making me think about how, um, you know, Swedenborg talks about how the spiritual world is flowing into the physical world, and, but like you said, there's an order to it. And so it just makes me think of the way that, you know, people are like, oh, I was, you know, thinking about so-and-so, and this bird flew by my window that I, you know, always see right. when I'm thinking of such-and-such. Such. So this, this way where sometimes the physical world and spiritual world seem to align and really, you know, it feels like you're being given a message when you find this physical object in a box and it's this thing that you've always been, you know, wanting or, yeah, so, or like yeah. looking for. And so it, it's hard to say. I mean, some people say, oh, that's just superstitious or something. But, um, but I also, I just love the line, like, well, the spiritual world is real. Like, so what is, how, who are we to judge necessarily? Like, if it's yeah. meaningful to you, you know, yeah. um, then, then maybe there's something to it. Yeah, and it's like, you know, there Swedenborg is saying that the spiritual world is constantly interacting directly with the physical world that everything we see as we'll look in our next segment everything we see in the physical world is actually a representation of the spiritual world so yeah I, I it does seem like you know and you look at like Native American spirituality and, and okay that this this kind of animal appearing at this time means something mm-hmm. and it you know there's there's got to be something in there on the flip side you know, you have your, like in the movie Beautiful Mind, when you think like on the newspaper, oh, they said that, so that means it's about my life, you know, so right. you, whatever it is, take it lightly. If it's, <laughs> if it's helping your life, it's good. If it's bottling you into some kind of misery, it ain't real, you yeah. know, something like that. So <laughs> Thane, do you want to take us home here, man? Yeah, uh, I don't have much to add, except I, I've never had the experience of, as far as I know, of, you know, visually seeing an angel speaking to me. Um, but I certainly wouldn't discount all of the many experiences throughout the world that people have shared of that. And just sort of on a lighthearted note, since we're taking it lightly, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, with the whole leaving the 20 on the street thing, I think that the angels part in that might be not so much making sure there's a 20 that you find, but maybe putting the thought in your mind, oh, did somebody lose their money? I wonder if I can get it back to them. (laughs) (laughs) Man, wet blanket. (laughs) Uh, To close, I drank all my water. Um, and I notice I'm always the one that drinks all my water, which means I talk too much. <laughs> we'll, we'll be right back to, to close with our correspondences segment. Stay tuned.
Okay, so we're back, and, and as we always do, we're going to close with sort of more a little more experiential type thing. Um, there's a segment we call Correspondences, which we do every week, and I was just blathering before the break about the Swedenborg says the spiritual world is constantly interacting with the physical world. The physical world is a representation of it. That's what the idea of correspondence is, is that you can see these spiritual truths and realities represented in these, these physical forms. So that's what we do every week here is try to show a physical form, giving the idea of the spiritual thing behind it. And then hopefully by having that spiritual idea in mind, looking at the physical, there's a, a connection there. So today we're going to be looking at palaces, um, which... Uh, there's a couple things you could say about it. You know, Swedenborg often talks about how a, a house, and this is this has been picked up by psychology as well, that a house is a symbol of the mind. If you dream about being in the attic, you know, it's, you're in the upper parts of your mind. So, in that the palaces, you know, these are, these are very fancy houses. You know, and this is like it, Swedenborg talks about actually homes on the other side being reflections of the mind, and that angels have these really great palace houses because some of them because of what's going on in the mind and you can kind of see palaces on the earth as like too opulent or something like that but just thinking of them as a symbol um that can be cool and then you had a before you had a, a sort of a passage uh that that swedenborg is talking about with uh with some relation to palaces do you want to give that back sure yeah just one of my favorite passages from from swedenborg's theology is uh he's talking about god's providence or um the way god guides us the way he operates in our lives and uh says that we can't see that operation sort of the way we can't necessarily hear the way angels are communicating with us but uh but that to us you know what's going on in our lives might just look like a, a heap of of rubble or building materials or whatever yeah but that in god's perspective he says it's a beautiful palace that is in the process of being built yeah which you could go on and on about like oh why did this experience happen yeah. why did this one happen you, so why is this piece of wood here? Little do you know that's going to be the beam. So all that's in your mind. Take a look at these, just 45 seconds of these images, and just see what hits you. I just think you can kind of see in this this scaling of houses, you know, and that something can get to be that big and magnificent, just sort of the potential of the mind to grow and develop. So hopefully you got something cool out of that. Hopefully you got something cool out of the whole show. If you're enjoying the show and want to help it thrive and spread, please consider making a small donation to the Swedenborg Foundation. Nonprofit, tax deductible. Just open up the description of this video. There should be a link in there to get you going. Thane and Chelsea. Thank you so much. I realize I never said what you were when I first introduced you, but Dane is a professor of theology and English at Bernathan College, and then Chelsea is a mom, as we <laughs> mentioned, and also <laughs> editor of newchurchperspective.com. Both of you guys said wonderful things today. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Thanks for, having for having us. Yeah, hopefully we can get you back again soon, and we'll see you guys uh, for the same deal next Monday. <laughs>